So it's my pleasure uh, to introduce Anna Gloin. Uh, she is uh, she has been working with uh, genetics of beta cell biology uh, and in health and disease for many years. She did her postdoc in Exeter with Andrew Hattersley, 16 years as a group leader and professor at Oxford University. And then in 2020, you moved to Stanford, where you're now a professor in pediatrics and genetics. You have done a lot of very interesting studies, seminal studies in monogenic forms of beta cell disease, paving the way for personalized medicine in, in the monogenic forms of diabetes. And now recently you also try to tease apart the genetics of more common forms of GVAS loci in type 2 diabetes. So we are very happy to have you here. Thank you very much for the introduction. I'm delighted to be here. I nearly wasn't here, but I arrived um, this morning, um, but my luggage has not. So I am still wearing the clothes that I've been wearing for the last two days. So apologies for that. Um, but this is a fantastic meeting and I'm really delighted to be here with such a diverse array of speakers and to have the opportunity to learn about metabolism. So let me see if I can get this to work. Oh, yes, looking good. OK, so March is Women's History Month. So I thought during my talk today I would take the opportunity to celebrate women in STEM. There are lots of you in the room today. A huge shout out to each and every one of you for the contributions that you're making to science. You're going to be entertained, I hope, today by illustrations of women and science throughout history from wonderful artwork, which I would encourage you all to get the book if you haven't already got so, from uh, Rachel Igontowski. It's available on Amazon. She does beautiful illustrations of our fam favorite female scientists. But because we want to look to the future as well, you're also going to have uh, artwork from the next generation of uh, female scientists. There are going to be some illustrations of what uh, young girls in the UK think a scientist should look like. Some of them are a little worrying. I'll just give you that as a heads up. Uh, this one here is my personal favorite because this uh, young scientist can come and work in my lab anytime. Look at that tidy bench. So as Torben said, uh, I've been working on the genetics of diabetes for uh, quite some time now. And really what I'm trying to do is use human genetics as a gateway into biological insights into how the pancreatic beta cells work. So I might take a rare mutation that's causal for a monogenic form of diabetes, or most recently, we take common variants that are present in the population that alter your risk of developing type 2 diabetes. And we use those changes in the DNA sequence as tools to understand cellular and molecular mechanisms that explain why uh, pancreatic islets and beta cells don't work in diabetes. And as Torben also said, what I and many others, of course, are hoping to do is to use this to fuel uh, improvements in clinical care. We're looking for those translational opportunities through precision medicine, perhaps through patient stratification, giving the right treatment to the right patient at the right time. So type 2 diabetes has actually become uh, somewhat of a poster child for complex traits. Um, and the reasons for this are really threefold. First of all, type 2 diabetes, as you know, is common in the population. And that means it's been relatively easy to assemble large cohorts of patients and to be able to genotype at scale, which means we've got lots of uh, GWAS signals. Secondly, and I think this is really elegant, what we can do with diabetes is we can use quantitative traits. So things that we know are associated with diabetes that we can measure in large numbers of people, like, for instance, anthropometric measurements with BMI. We can look at blood pressure. We can look at lipids. We can look at measures of beta cell function. And we can use those to help us get physiological insights into how GWAS signals might be operating. Another huge advantage that we've had is that we've got a fairly good idea about the underlying tissues that are involved in diabetes risk. And this has facilitated the generation of omic data sets that have been very important in recent years in understanding non-coding variation. 
So what do we know at the moment about the genetic basis for type 2 diabetes? Well, I'd say at this point in time, we probably know about 50% of the genetic risk for type 2 diabetes. We've got around 670 independent signals that map to just over 530 uh, loci or regions in our genome that are associated with diabetes risk. So if you look at this uh, schematic that uh, we've put together uh, very recently for uh, a review article, you can see here a timeline of the discovery of genetic loci. I'll draw your attention to uh, Casey and J11. This will be one that Torben will be very familiar with. We had uh, our groups had back-to-back -back, uh, publications in 2003, reporting that as one of two robustly associating candidate gene studies. But as we move across time, you'll see that the way that we've discovered loci has changed from candidate gene studies through uh, linkage studies to GWAS studies. And if you look at these uh, pie charts, you can see that most of the studies that we've performed have been in European uh, populations. So each of these is an opportunity to uncover novel biology, but it's been pretty difficult to go from these wonderful uh, clues to uh, molecular mechanisms because a large proportion of these signals don't sit neatly in the protein coding regions of the genome, rather they sit in non-coding regions of the genome which are presumed to affect gene regulation. So why is it so difficult to go from those non-coding signals to biological insights? Well, the reasons really are that it's very difficult to know whether or not that SNP is affecting gene A, gene B, or even gene C. And if we don't know which gene is affected, we can't then move into the laboratory to start to think about what happens when you perturb that gene in a diabetes-relevant cell type. It gets even more complicated because, of course, gene regulation is context-specific. Uh, and that means we have to ask these questions thinking about where in the body this gene might be expressed. When is it expressed? Is it a developmental gene or is it in adulthood? And does it rely on a particular perturbation or stimulus for us to be able to see that effect? So given this complexity, you can understand that it's become quite challenging to move from those associated variants to understanding the underlying effect of transcripts. So human eyelids are, of course, a, a key tissue. We know they're important for uh, type 1 and for type 2 diabetes. They are the cells in our body that are responsible for making the hormones insulin and glucagon that are so important for controlling blood glucose levels. But they're not an accessible tissue, unfortunately. We can't just go around and get biopsies from individuals and do this at scale. So the way we've been able to assemble a large uh, data sets of human islets is largely through cadaveric donors. Now, I've been very fortunate over the years, first of all in Oxford and in collaboration with Patrick McDonald at the University of Alberta in Edmonton, and now that I'm in the US through the HERN and HPAC to have uh, access to uh, human islet material. And with collaborators in Oxford, Edmonton, and through HPAP, we've been able to systematically characterize these islets to put down cellular phenotypes and to couple this with detailed genetic and omic studies, starting initially at bulk tissue level, but of course more recently with changes in technology being able to do this at single cell resolution. So this has provided an enormous opportunity with this uh, assembled data set to start to ask questions about how changes in the DNA sequence alter function of the islets and alter gene expression. So what I thought I'd do is take you through a few examples of how we've used these resources um, to understand the underlying transcripts that mediate type 2 diabetes GWAS signals, highlight some of the challenges that we face, and then show you some of the ways that we're now trying to work at scale to close some of those gaps. So this is one of our first uh, flurries into understanding how changes in our DNA sequence alter gene expression and how this might identify the effect of transcripts at type 2 diabetes GWAS signals. This was work led by Martin van der Bunt when he was a PhD student working with myself and Mark McCarthy in Oxford. And it's a collaboration with Patrick MacDonald at the University of uh, Alberta in Edmonton. 
in this initial study, we had uh, islets available from 118 human donors. And we were able to ask the question, are there changes in the DNA sequence that we know alter your risk of developing diabetes that also influence expression of a gene in pancreatic islets? And in doing so, Martin was able to identify uh, uh, SNPs in a gene called ZMIS1, where we could show that the same SNPs that altered risk for diabetes influenced expression of this transcription factor. So now we have a potential uh, transcription factor that's involved in diabetes. How do we understand whether or not those uh, changes in gene expression are relevant for the underlying biology and pathophysiology of type 2 diabetes? Well, this is where it starts to get complicated because it becomes really hard to assemble the types of data that you need to have confidence that this is a gene that's involved in diabetes pathogenesis. So we reached out to uh, Pat and his lab to see whether or not we could generate a mouse where we would specifically knock out the transcription factor in the pancreatic beta cells and to see what happened to the physiological phenotype of that mouse. So this was work that was led by uh, Tamada, uh, who was a postdoc in the time with Pat and is now joining me uh, at Stanford to follow on from this work. And what Tamada does did was she uh, used the INSCRE mouse to knock out the uh, transcription factor ZMIS exclusively in the pancreatic beta cells. We knew that this transcription factor had a role uh, in uh, uh, a number of different cancers. We knew that it was uh, implicated in both repressing and coactivating genes, but we had no idea what it might be doing in a pancreatic uh, beta cell. So the first thing that Tamada did was she uh, phenotyped the mice. And she was able to show that the mice where they had lost uh, ZMIS from their uh, pancreatic beta cells were glucose intolerant. Um, this was particularly observed in the female mice. When she isolated the islets from those mice, she was able to show that they were irresponsive to, uh, unresponsive to uh, glucose. And you can see this in the uh, uh, secretion assays. So losing this transcription factor from the pancreatic beta cells results in glucose intolerance, a most severe phenotype seen in the female mice, and it also results in reduced glucose-stimulated insulin secretion from isolated islets. So we then went on to see what happened when we challenged these mice on a high-fat diet. And what Tamada was able to do was to establish that the mice were unable to uh, increase their beta cell mass in response to a high-fat diet when they had lost this transcription factor ZMIS from their pancreatic beta cells. So given the fact that this is a transcription factor, we were interested in understanding the uh, transcriptional uh, pathways that it might be regulating. So we isolated the islets and sent them off for transcriptomic analysis. Looking at the data, Tamada was able to identify that there were a number of genes that are involved in beta cell identity and also in maturity that were altered in the islets of mice that had lost this transcription factor. So again, this shows that losing the zinc finger transcription factor from the islets, uh, the pancreatic beta cells of the islets, results in immature uh, islets that are, uh, have metabolic defects. So that was all in a mouse. We really wanted to go back to humans. So fortunately, we were able to go back to our data set where we've been uh, genotyping and phenotyping islets from human cadaveric donors. And we could look at the islets from individuals who harbored the type 2 diabetes risk variants in the ZMIS gene. And Nicole Krentz was able to demonstrate that if you have the type 2 diabetes risk allele, you have defects both in insulin content and in defects in insulin secretion. So showing that changes in Zima's expression in humans also result in a, uh, uh, an islet phenotype. So that work really took us quite some time. You can see the original paper was published in 2015, but it's not until the end of last year that we were able to bring together a story to show that that transcription factor was involved in uh, type 2 diabetes. And I think that really demonstrates the amount of work that goes into each one of those signals to try and have confidence that you've actually identified the correct underlying effect to transcript. That first study was also only in 118 uh, samples. So working with colleagues uh, around the world, 
faith group over the uh, uh, the bridge in uh, Malmo with uh, Manolis Dermatakis in uh, Geneva and with Steve Parker and uh, Michael Stitzel over in the States, we decided we'd bring together our respective data sets of human islets and put them through a shared analytical uh, pipeline to take 402 human islet donors and to reanalyze them with this single common pathway. In doing so, we were able to identify 23 uh, EQTLs uh, at 22 uh, loci, and that's giving us 13 novel effector transcripts. So this really showed the power of bringing together larger sample sizes and our ability, therefore, to identify additional effector transcripts. A couple of other key things to mention. First of all, if we had been doing this study in uh, other tissues other than human islets, we would not have been able to detect these effector transcripts. So that shows the importance of working with the correct uh, tissue. And also, if you look here at our enrichment analysis, you can see that we only see an enrichment for glycemic traits and type 2 diabetes and not for type 1 diabetes, fitting uh, with uh, Annette's earlier uh, talk. So those were adult islets, and if you remember at the start when I talked about why it's so difficult, I mentioned context. So one of the things we've wanted to do is extend our analysis from human I uh, adult islets into the developing pancreas. Unfortunately, uh, I'm close now uh, geographically to uh, Julie Snedden, who is based at UCSF. And Julie has an interest in the uh, developing pancreas and has been working to assemble important omic resources that help us understand the transcriptional landscape in the developing uh, fetus. So working with uh, Julie and a talented uh, PhD student, Sean Delalio, from her lab, we've been able to make use of a uh, resource that she's assembled where she's done multi-ohms, so paired RNA sequencing and attack seq samples at single cell resolution on a 12-week uh, human fetal pancreas tissue. And we've been able to use that to look at the intersection of genetic data for both type 1 and type 2 diabetes to see whether or not there's evidence, firstly, of an enrichment of signals in the developing uh, fetus, and then specifically to see what loci might be playing a role in development. So this has been led by Han Sun and Seth Sharp in my lab. And first of all, we've been able to show, as you see here, an enrichment of signals for type 2 diabetes in the developing uh, pancreas. And if you look over here at the uh, transcription factors that are at play, you'll see many familiar uh, names here, such as HNF1-alpha, HNF1-beta, CCND2 and KCNQ1, which is actually at the locus with CD, uh, CDCAL1C. Uh, so I think we're showing here that many of the signals that we have identified are working in the developing uh, fetal tissue, setting you up for type 2 diabetes uh, later in life. So what I want to do now is really talk about the fact that we can identify potential uh, genes that are underlying GWAS signals because we see an effect on gene expression. But a really important sanity check is to note that a change in gene expression does not necessarily equal disease causation. We know at uh, GWAS signals there's an enormous amount of pleiotrophy and that we might see uh, signals that are showing us effects in one tissue that have absolutely nothing to do with the pathway to becoming uh, somebody with diabetes. And that means we need to find a way to perturb genes so that we can understand what the cellular and physiological consequences are of altering expression of that gene. And one of the ways that we've chosen to do this over the last few years is really to take this shortcut, the low-hanging fruit, of asking, are there coding variants that are causally associated with type 2 diabetes risk that we can use as a way of interrogating this in humans? So I'm going to take you through quite quickly a published example to set up the premise. So uh, some time back now, uh, through the GO type 2 and type 2 diabetes gene study, we identified causal coding variants in uh, a gene called PAM. We were able in our laboratory to develop uh, assays that determined that uh, these uh, type 2 diabetes associated alleles resulted in a loss of PAM function. <coughs> We could then show in a human pancreatic beta cell that if you lose the PAM protein, you get an effect on insulin content and insulin secretion. 
We could also show that this led to uh, altered granule, insulin granule exocytosis. And we could then go back to human primary islets and show that if you carried one of these variants, you had the same phenotype of reduced insulin content and secretion. So what I'm showing you here really is a way of using human genetics and having coding alleles as nature's gene perturbation assay. So this is a really nice way of going in with confidence from the human genetics that something is on the causal pipe, blind to diabetes, and then being able to perturb it in a cell. But not every gene that we're interested in uh, that underlies a GWAS hit has a coding variant in it that we can use as one of these nature's uh, coding assays. So we need to find a way to scale this up. And to do that, we need to be able to work either targeted or genome-wide, and we need to identify uh, cellular phenotypes that are relevant for diabetes. And then we need to work in human cellular models that are disease-relevant and genetically modifiable. So our first attempt to do this was published some time back now, where we took 300 genes at 75 GWAS loci, either for fasting glucose or type 2 diabetes, and then took five cellular phenotypes, four for uh, insulin secretion and one for cell count. And we did this in a human uh, endo CBTRH1 cell model. So we developed a high-throughput assay using acoustic liquid handling, which allowed us to miniaturize our insulin secretion assay, making it affordable at 20 cents per data point. And this is the work of Cern Thompson, who was a PhD student in the lab at the time. And this shows here his, uh, an enormous amount of his PhD on a single slide. And taking those 300 genes, he was able to identify 67 hits, 15 genes that I, uh, were associated with an effect on cell count, and 52 that hit one of those four insulin secretory phenotypes. This meant that he'd identified 45 genes at 37 GWAS loci where there was a reason to believe that they could be affecting uh, pancreatic beta cell function. As a sanity check, if you look at the data here, you'll see some firm favorites, HNF1-alpha, ABCC8, HNF4-alpha. So genes that we know are really important for pancreatic beta cell function because when mutated, they cause monogenic forms of diabetes. Those of you with sharp eyes, though, will also spot z -Miz. So z -Miz, if you remember, was the affected transcript that we picked up in our early CISEQTL analysis. And here in a second independent experiment, we're picking it up as a gene that's involved in insulin secretion and in cell count. But remember, it took us a very long time to go from that CISEQTL to understanding that this was a gene involved in uh, beta cell biology. So if we were able to assemble these large data sets at an earlier stage, we could integrate data and really make significant headway at identifying genes that we want to prioritize for targeted follow-up. So 300 genes, 75 loci, pretty good, but can we do better? So what we've been working on in the uh, last few years is to go from our targeted siRNA screens to going genome-wide using CRISPR. And this has the advantage of allowing us to generate a data set that we can keep going back to. So as more and more GWAS are published, we can go back to our data set that we've already generated and we can do lookups. But to do a genome-wide screen, you have to do this in a uh, suitable cell model that is disease-relevant, is one that is amenable to uh, uh, genetic uh, manipulation, and you need a disease-relevant uh, phenotype. So over the last few years, um, a number of our studies have pointed to the fact that insulin content is, uh, uh, if you like, the canary in the mine. It is something that it seems to be altered when we uh, perturb type 2 diabetes risk genes. We saw this with z -Miz, we saw this with PAM, and in a paper that we published uh, uh, last month in Diabetologia, we've been able to demonstrate it with the uh, diabetes gene REV1. So on the basis of being confident that this is disease relevant, we set out to uh, design a genome-wide screen to identify all the genes in the genome that alter the amount of insulin that you have in a pancreatic beta cell. And this was the work of Antje Rotner Negrotz, who was a PhD student in my lab in Oxford. Antia designed an assay using the Toronto Knockout Library, which has around 18,000 uh, genes represented in it, with four guide RNAs per gene. 
and she uh, developed an assay that meant that she got a single guide into a human pancreatic beta cell so that we could look at what the effect was of each of those 18,000 genes on the amount of insulin that your uh, beta cells made. So we could uh, uh, infect the cells, grow the cells up, and then separate them using fluorescent activated cell sorting into populations of cells with a lot of insulin and not much insulin. Isolate the DNA from those cell populations and sequence it, and then map back the guide RNAs. And in doing so, we could identify all the genes that regulate how much insulin is in a human pancreatic beta cell. So this was not for the faint-hearted. Uh, this was a Herculean effort by Antia. It took her four months to uh, grow the 700 million cells that were required for two rounds of the screen. Anybody in this room who has worked with a human endo cb h one cell will have enormous sympathy for Antia because these are tricky cells to work with. But thankfully, um, the uh, screen was successful, and Antia was able to identify 580 genes which influence how much insulin is in a human uh, pancreatic beta cell. And this is a wonderful uh, data set, not just for what we're interested in, which is integrating it with human genetic data, but it's now a reference data set that anybody can go in and use if you have a gene that you're interested in and you want to know whether or not it alters, uh, it influences how much insulin is in a human beta cell. So as I said, our interest was to intersect this data with uh, uh, human genetic data. So we took uh, 336 predicted type 2 diabetes genes. They'd been predicted by a number of different methods, and we intersected this with Antia's list of 580 genes. This gave us an intersection of 20 genes. And we decided that we would focus on the gene that we knew nothing about in pancreatic beta cells that we thought would be the most interesting in terms of revealing new biology. And that was Calcoco2. So what does Calcoco2 do in a human uh, pancreatic beta cell? Well, when we looked very closely at the beta cells when they lost Calcoco2, we were able to demonstrate that they had fewer insulin granules. And when we looked carefully at the morphology of the uh, granules, we were able to see that uh, it seemed to be the immature granules that had been preferentially lost. And this was backed up when we measured proinsulin levels following knockdown, and we saw that proinsulin levels were also reduced. So what causes the reduction in insulin content and the fewer number of transitioning and immature granules? Well, Ying Ying, when she was looking very carefully at her uh, EM images, she started to observe these uh, large vacuolated structures. And these were reminiscent of uh, images that she'd seen that were associated with autophagy. So she set about to look at this directly uh, by inhibiting autophagy and then using LC3 as a marker to see whether or not it was uh, increased following a knockdown of Calcoco2. And in doing this, she was able to show that there was evidence of autophagy following Calcoco2, and this was altering uh, insulin granule homeostasis. So uh, at the point at which we published our work uh, in January this year, we were able to say that our screen of uh, uh, genome-wide screen of uh, uh, genes involved in insulin content identified uh, Calcoco2, and that we were able to demonstrate that this was uh, through a role in autophagy, and it was uh, particularly targeting recently synthesized granules. But there was something else that was troubling us, and that's when we looked at the EM, uh, Ying Ying also noticed that there was uh, evidence of mitophagy because the um, uh, mitochondrial had uh, abnormal Christi. So we looked to see whether or not ATP production was altered, but there were no changes in ATP. But we were still really troubled by these uh, very funky-looking mitochondria. So when Yong Hyun Lee arrived in the lab uh, with a uh, background and expertise in autophagy and mitophagy, we set about to look in more detail with a uh, seahorse. For those of you not familiar with how the seahorse uh, uh, works, let me draw your attention to a couple of key points. Basically, we have the cells with, uh, which are either knocked down or uh, with uh, control siRNAs, and we're going to apply a number of different chemicals that allow us to get basal respiration, ATP production, and maximal respiration. 
And as you can see, as um, Ying Ying had shown, there's no effect on ATP production, but we see a very uh, marked difference here between uh, the uh, knockdown in purple and the siRNA in green, where we see this big effect on the spare capacity. So this really shows us that if you started to put the beta cells under stress, they won't be able to respond. And we think this also contributes to their inability to respond appropriately to glucose and to increase risk for type 2 diabetes. So if we bring this last piece of the data into the picture, in addition to our published data, we can now say that we followed up on the abnormal mitochondria and we see an effect that's uh, reminiscent of mitophagy and we see evidence of reduced mitochondrial capacity. So let me summarize what I've taken you through uh, today. So I started off telling you about our early work doing cis-EQTL analysis in human pancreatic islets and the identification of ZMIS as an effector transcript at a type 2 diabetes GWAS locus. And then our follow-up work in mouse that has shown that it's involved in beta cell maturation, metaboli metabolism and adaptation to a high-fat diet. I've also shown you unpublished data of evidence that some of the type 2 diabetes GWAS variants are exerting their effect during development. I've shown you uh, our data on a high throughput screen and how we've been able to use that with uh, uh, omic data, such as our transcriptomics, to uncover effector transcripts at type 2 diabetes GWAS loci. And then I finished up with giving you an example of a new uh, effector transcript for type 2 diabetes that we've shown is involved in insulin granule homeostasis through autophagy. So let me uh, finish up by thanking the team uh, back at Stanford. Here you can see photographs from uh, last year. Um, from the team, uh, celebrating uh, weddings, uh, births, uh, graduations. Uh, our lab motto, be kind, and this is our wall of triumph with paper since we've arrived at Stanford and team outings. And then finally, uh, thanks to collaborators uh, and to all the individuals who are involved in the work, the artists, and of course the funders. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anna, for an absolutely fantastic talk, and especially that you arrived 3 a.m. AM this morning after more than 24 <laughs> hours of travel. And Amazing. I've not slept. <laughs> <laughs> I'm on coffee. Yeah. So, so questions for Anna. Thank you for a nice and exciting talk. Can you listen to me? Yeah. Uh, my question is in connection to adipose tissue because your focus has been mostly. I'm over here. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. It has been mostly beta cell function and yeah, the pancreas. Uh, as as you know, the adipocytes when they are exposed to an obesogenic or hyperinsulinemic environment, they are able to re-enter the cell cycle and then create metabolic dysfunction. So my question is, have you considered in your analysis to perform? Uh, similar um, uh, analysis that you have done in consideration of adipose tissues, and then see how if there's a crosstalk between pancreas and adipose tissue and how this affects type 2 diabetes risk. And my second question is in connection to the fact that you focus on type 2 diabetes GWAS loci, because those also have been uh, discovered, or not, not all of them, some of them have been discovering adiposity loci like BMI or body fat distribution. So what do you usually do with that? So qu first question in connection to the crosstalk and the second question in con connection to the GWAS. Thank you. Excellent questions. Um, so you're absolutely right. Um, there are many uh, cell types that we could be looking at in our lab, but we've chosen to work on the islet. That's where my, I believe my expertise lies. And I think others are much better placed to uh, work on uh, adipocytes and hepatocytes uh, and neurons. Um, so I'm going to deal with your second question first. And I happen to have a here's one I prepared earlier slide. Um, so one of the things that we're working on in the Accelerated Medicines Partnership at the moment is extending the work that we've done in islets to other cell types. And I have the absolute delight to work with Melina Klausnitzer, who I'm sure will be familiar to many of you in the room. And with Melina, we are uh, looking to do similar uh, screens uh, that we've done in beta cells in adipocytes with readouts that are important for uh, adipocyte function. So I'm hoping that through that and similar efforts, with Karen Mulkey, with Ines Cibola and others, as a community, we can assemble the resources that will give us a full picture across tissues. And ultimately, we need 
more cellular phenotypes as well. So I think we've got that in hand and others are working on that. The other question you asked about looking at the interaction between uh, cell types is fascinating and it's certainly something that I would be very interested to do but it's a, not a trivial undertaking and I think it's one that needs to be done in a stepwise uh, manner, thinking about where you would focus effort and resources, but it's definitely something that has uh, intellectual and scientific me merit. We have a question from Tune Pierce. Yeah, Tune Pierce, University of Copenhagen. Um, thank you for a great talk, I very much um, enjoyed it. I was fas fascinated by the polygenicity of the insulin content phenotype. And I'm, I'm, um, so I'm, I'm curious in, um, well my, my question basically is, given that you are able to do the genome-wide screens, you should also now be able to just screen, n not focus on a specific phenotype, but sp be specific to the molecular phenotype and then just using relevant um, um, uh, cell lines and cell systems, screen a lot, uh, screen, screen for an array of phenotypes to f systematically map what are the cellular phenotypes that in a beta cell are impacted by genetic variants? I'm, I'm a little slow. <laughs> so um, I'm thinking it through. So you're absolutely right. There are, there are lots of different ways that you can end up with not having enough insulin in the beta cell. And we could do pathway analysis. We did. And you can see that there are different routes to having not enough of the hormone. What do you mean by putting it into the... Um I, I, I just meant it was... Um, I, I understood the rationale for yes. looking at insulin content, but you could, I, I guess you could take it a step further and maybe you are just being agnostic to the phenotype and uh, CRISPR, use CRISPR I and A to knock out genes and then systematically map, measure dozens of phenotypes to sort of get at other phenotypes that are relevant beyond um, insulin content? You, yes, you, you, I'd love to do that. It's uh, uh, <laughs> six years' work to do one phenotype. And uh, <laughs> yeah, it would be great to be able to do that. So I have a question. Mm -hmm. So um, how do you see your findings uh, on a background of polygenicity? So high polygenic uh, load, uh, risk load, and also in the your own question to the previous speaker on ancestry. Yeah, no, great question. One of the things I'm really excited about at the moment, um, which we're doing with Patrick McDonald, and also through the uh, integrated islet distribution program in the States, is um, I've genotyped all of the islets from both programs, which means that we can start to look at how those islets behave differently if you're at the extremes of the uh, polygenic risk score. So this follows on from work that uh, Leif Group and uh, Patrick Rosman did you know, many moons ago when we just had a handle uh, uh, you know, 13 uh, signals. Now we can do this across the whole lot and you can see clear differences. But we can relate that as well to more complex phenotypes and insul insulin secretion. We can look at it to do with cell morphology. We can look to do with uh, exocytosis. So I think that's going to be enormously useful in terms of understanding uh, that data. It still remains a, a problem that the diversity of the samples that we're working on is not as good as it should be. Um, we're starting to be more um, uh, proactive about collecting uh, resources that are more representative of people with diabetes. Um, but there's still a lot of work to be done. Do, do you think IPS cells will have a role in this? We thought we we have thought about that route, but there are humongous challenges. Um, anybody who's working on trying to make a human beta cell uh, and to characterize it will know that there's enormous heterogeneity, and that's even when you've got the same isogenic background. So if you want to then start thinking about differences between individuals when you have that enormous noise, it's it's not a an undertaking that's particularly attractive. We we have a question up there. Hi, thank you for the um, wonderful talk. It was super inspiring. One question I had, so you were screening for the insulin content of the cell, and you find a large number of hits. But I, I was kind of surprised by, I guess, how not few, but only 20 of them, right, overlap with type 2 diabetes GWAS hits. So what is your, like, why don't you, does that suggest that insulin content is less of a overall relevant phenotype 
to be measuring, or do you think that with more sample size in your GWASs, more you would find start to find more overlap with those hits, or is it just that the big effect sizes are the ones that are overlapping? Sort of, how do you kind of interpret that result? Great question. So. When we got the 20, we were like, oh my goodness, we thought only 20. And then we looked at our SysEQTL analysis and how many we were getting uh, through integrating the omics, and it's around the same. So actually, the hit rate isn't too bad. The 580 is 580 with a false discovery rate of point, uh, point 0.1. So we are very, very, very comfortable that we have uh, got only true positives there. There's a lot of stuff bubbling under that could have got through if we'd been less stringent. Um, there are lots of ways to become somebody who has diabetes, whether uh, you can compensate for that insulin content through another mechanism, I think is also uh, something that we need to investigate further. Great, thank you so much. So one final quick question here. And a really lovely talk. So your student got to mitophagy by looking at the electron micrographs, but if you now go back to the CRISPR screen and you look at the volcano plot, are there mitochondrial signals there as well? Great question. So that's something we're doing more systematically at the moment. We started off first with the autophagy and we've been uh, working our way through those, but we want to look at mitophagy as well, yes. Okay, thank you very much, Anna. And, and then we will break for lunch and poster sessions. And please be back here half past one sharp for Leslie Shaw's talk. <laughs>